put a fork in it because 2023 is done. My Life in Gaming turned a decade old this year, and while it wasn't quite the banner year for releases on the channel that we were hoping for, we managed to pull it together decently towards the end. Y'all seem to really love these recaps to see whatever it is we got around to playing each year, whether it be the brand spanking new hotness or surprising classics that we should be embarrassed about having never even tried. That's probably a bit extreme, but whatever. Anyway, what do you say, Nelly? Let's get going with the games that we played in 2023. kind of knocked me a bit off balance. Taking on too much work outside of my life in gaming had a negative impact on our output, for which I greatly apologize. And it also had an impact on the number of games I managed to finish throughout the year. I think we've got things pretty straightened out now though, and with all that we've managed to accomplish in the last two months of the year, it feels like we're back on track. Now, if you'll recall, in 2022, we decide to start a new tradition where we each pick 10 games that we pledge to beat in the following year. As to whether we were successful in finishing all of them or not, and what the consequences for failing to do so may be, well, that's for later in the video. But you'll find our pledge games peppered throughout, and we'll start with one of the pledge games that I was the most excited to play through. I honestly can't believe it took me five years to finally get around to beating freaking Mega Man 11. I mean, it's Mega Man, the 11th numbered Mega Man, come on. The long journey began shortly after release in October 2018 when I started it on stream and beat uh, only one Robot Master. That same screen just makes me feel bad. <laughs> it's like two hours and exactly one is grayed out. So I was caught off guard by just how challenging it was. And I wasn't in the right frame of mind at the time to immediately continue a game that was going to be a much steeper hill to climb than expected. I mean, don't get me wrong. Mega Man games usually are fairly challenging and they should be. But here, the levels turned out to be much longer than they traditionally are, which makes reaching the boss on a limited set of lives quite a lot more difficult than in the NES games, I'd say. So, since I did, of course, restart the game in 2023 and successfully finished it, I think the best thing about it is its selection of weapons acquired from the bosses. The vast majority of them are cleverly designed and are a lot of fun to use throughout the levels, rather than mostly just being easy ways to beat the bosses. On the whole, I'd say it's the best and best balanced weapon loadout in any Mega Man game. I still think the levels might have been a bit better if they were a bit snappier to finish, and the double gear speed up and slow down system didn't really interest me too much personally, often to my detriment as it took me a while to ramp up how often I actually took advantage of it. But on the whole, this is an excellent return to form for a classic series that I have a huge amount of love for, and I do hope we'll one day see a Mega Man 12. A Mega Man like that I went in with low expectations for was Metaloid Origin. I almost passed on buying it from physical publisher Red Art Games because I felt burned more than a few times by the quality of some of the games they've chosen to release, but this one turned out to be a pleasant surprise. It's certainly not pushing any boundaries, but it feels pretty good to play, has satisfyingly hidden secrets, worthwhile weapon upgrades, and a nice 1995 look about it. In fact, working on this part of the video made me curious to go back and try the developer's previous effort, Metagal, which is even shorter, but similarly enjoyable. Both games sort of make me think of Shockman on Turbo Graphics, and th they've got this off-brand, but we've got Mega Man at home vibes, as the memers would say. They got a bit of jank for sure, but are definitely punching well above their digital price bracket. 
Metagal and Metaloid Origin are just five and seven bucks respectively. So if you've got a bit of leftover funds burning a hole in the digital wallet on your platform of choice, you can buy yourself an enjoyable evening or so of perfectly cromulent action platforming. Amagon is hardly considered an all-time NES classic. If anything, I gather that people might generally consider it to be a bit bad. You see, Amagon is this little doofus-looking dude with a gun who dies in one hit, but once you collect a power-up and rack up enough of a score, you can hit the select button to trade your points into health for Megadon, your ultimate fighting form. The more points you have when you transform, the more hits Megadon can take. And if you successfully finish the level as Megadon, any remaining health goes back into points for the next level, which is crucial. Enemies usually only drop bonus points when you're in regular form, so you won't get a lot of bonus points when in Megadon form. In other words, if you go Megadon too early, you might run out of health before you even get to the boss, and you'll have not recouped enough points to transform again with a useful amount of health. So there's actually an interesting bit of strategy that goes into determining the right moment for swapping the fragile shooty dude for the tanky punchy dude, and I'm here to tell you, it's actually strangely compelling. Each boss is also pretty large and interesting looking, including one that I'm convinced inspired a boss in Donkey Kong Country 3. It's a super common and very cheap NES card, and I honestly think it's worth giving it a chance. The Japanese title for Amagon is Totsuzen Macho Man, or Suddenly Macho Man, which is kind of amazing and a great way to describe the game. Who knows, maybe we'll see Amagon again someday. I mean, if Toki can get a remake, why not Amagon? The way things have been lately, anything can get a remake. A lot of years have kind of felt like the year of the remake lately, but 2023 really might take the crown on that one. Although, to tell the truth, it's a trend that I enjoy. There's certainly plenty of new games to enjoy out there, too many, honestly. So I don't think there's anything wrong with also offering new ways to experience or revisit the classics. It was a long wait, but Advance Wars 1 and 2 Reboot Camp finally released in April, and I love it. Ever since it was unveiled, there were a lot of complaints about the visual style, and I honestly don't get it. The character models and general look and feel are exactly what I would expect Advance Wars to look like in 3D, and I think the COs have a lot of personality with their animations. The only criticism that I have is that it can be a bit difficult to distinguish the different types of vehicles at a glance compared to the old sprites, but on the whole, I think this game is exactly what it should be. This is actually the only version of Advance Wars 1 that I own, as I started with the second game, so I prioritized playing through the first campaign this year, but I'd love to replay AW2 on Reboot Camp sometime. And come, Sancho Panza! Let us rescue the Princess Dulcinea! You gotta hurt yourself. Did Resident Evil 4 really need a remake? Well, I played the original version so many times on GameCube and Wii that I never could muster the motivation to get all the way through any of the HD versions. So, fully reimagining the RE4 scenario in a way that mostly recaptures the spirit of the original while also being substantially fresh enough to surprise and delight those of us who had played the original just a few too many times for it to be fun anymore, well, that turned out to actually be much more worthwhile than it might have seemed when some of us were bummed that Capcom weren't instead remaking something that more desperately needs a reimagining, like Code Veronica. At any rate, the RE4 remake is excellent. It isn't quite as masterfully B-movie cheesy as the original, but it's obvious that the developers definitely understood the target that they needed to aim for. Keep your dogs on a leash, people. I still prefer 2 Remake, I personally think that's the best game from the entire PS4 Xbox One generation, but 4 Remake is not all that far behind. Pretty much a master of unlocking. 
I'd love to play it again in VR, but at the moment, it remains my only substantial motivation to buy a PSVR 2 at all. Come on, Sony, put some effort into convincing me. The Narvista doors are gone. Really? This was the first time I saved one of these RE remakes for spooky season streaming, which resulted in plenty of great moments from being trolled into believing that the insectoid Novistadors were cut from the remake seconds before they first appear. These are strange. Oh, die you! <laughs> to a congratulations alert from the chat being the perfect randomized clip for the perfect moment right at the end. Mission accomplished. Right <laughs> Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe on Switch is every bit the flawless platforming goodness that it was back in 2011, where it became a top three game for me on the Wii. I wasn't too sure about the cell shaded outline style when it was first shown off, but it definitely grew on me as I played through, which I did even though I replayed the original version on hard mode not all that many years ago because it's just that dang good. I hope that this is a sign that more Kirby remakes will come, freeing the 3DS games from their handheld shackles. Kirby Planet Robobot Deluxe would be my number one request, but I really have to wonder if a remake of Kirby Triple Deluxe might be Kirby Triple Deluxe Deluxe? <laughs> a Super Mario RPG remake? Now that's something I certainly thought I'd never see. Unfortunately, this version of the Mushroom Kingdom was never revisited, with the in-house developed Mario games and the Intelligent Systems and Alpha Dream RPGs going in a very different direction. As a result, Squaresoft's interpretation of this world, characters, and what kinds of creatures inhabit it seemed ever stranger and more and more off-brand as the years went on. So the fact that this game came back in remade form at all, let alone as faithfully as has been done, is such a shock, but one that makes me very happy to see. It is a bit odd to think, though, how Squaresoft's rudimentary 3D models seem so cutting edge in 1996, but are considered outdated today, only to be replaced with simple polygon models in the Unity engine in 2023. The obvious polygon edges sort of go against the aesthetic of the original game where shapes were rendered as seemingly perfectly rounded. Don't get me wrong, I overall like the look of the new remake well enough, but what if they'd leaned even more into the 90s CGI aesthetic, either on a future Nintendo system with more power, or if they'd simply re-rendered the poses and environments in HD and built it as a sprite-based game like the original? I think presenting the remake as a time capsule or celebration of that quainter era of CG graphics would have resulted in the new version being far more aesthetically timeless than it may end up being. And of course, there was also Metroid Prime Remastered, which is so masterfully done that my excitement for Metroid Prime 4 is fully renewed. Activating gyro aiming in the menu was a bit tough to figure out, but so worth using. It feels great playing Metroid Prime on Switch. So do you think 2024 will finally be the year of Metroid Prime 4? It has to be, right? Cross-gen launch game for Switch 2, maybe? That's what I'm hoping for. I guess by the time we're doing next year's video, we'll know whether or not that actually panned out. I began 2023 full of determination to play all 10 games on my pledge list, but this year had other plans as it ended up being stuffed as fat as a Wegman sub with incredible games. How would I do when being face down with an onslaught of such quality? I'm hungry. Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice was on my 10 games to play in 2023 list. I heard it was pretty short, but impactful, which sounds right up my alley. If I remember correctly, it was developed on a lower budget to give the team at Ninja Theory more creative freedom. As such, it's always being mentioned as a beautiful and unique take on the Unreal Engine style third person action game. And I absolutely agree. It's gorgeous, and the audio work is simply on another level. You hear them too, Senos? Yes, yes. I heard this, Chris. 
noise. And I still hear the mouth. The game recommends using headphones, but in this case, I went with my surround sound system, which uh, may or may not have done justice to it. But I'm not even sure if my headphones would even be good enough in the first place. I can't do it. They're too strong. Gameplay-wise, I'll admit there wasn't really much that kept me going. Combat was pretty standard fare, and the visual puzzles, like lining up various symbols, aren't typically something that compel me. Another segment had Senua fumbling around in the dark, and it goes on for so long that it almost had me up and quitting right there. I understand that the game wants you to feel like Senua does, and it succeeds at such a level that it took a serious toll on my enjoyment to the point where I'm not even sure if I'll be back for the sequel. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker was an enhanced port from the Wii U to the Switch that I put on my games to playlist for 2023. Now, I'll freely admit that I avoided these sections in Super Mario 3D World for the most part because, well, I just didn't feel like deviating from the main level progression. I was having such a good time with the game that I felt these levels slowed things down a bit too much, and I never played them beyond when I was forced to. It's not that I didn't like them, I just didn't feel like playing them in the context of that game. However, in a situation where they are the main attraction, as they are in Treasure Tracker, then I can focus in and get comfy. In this mindset, I found the gameplay to be so much more compelling and just a nice way to spend an hour each night. As I played it, I kept coming back to the idea that it feels like a black box era Nintendo game, like a modern equivalent to Gyromite or Wrecking Crew, where it does one style of gameplay extremely well and doesn't feel the need to go really nuts with it. Just a really solid experience with a few frills, you know? Oh, yeah! Oh. Gato Roboto from the lovably named Doink Soft is a minimalistic Metroidvania. Oh, actually, sorry, Catroidvania. Huh, uh, clever. Roboto seems to pride itself in being a quick little romp that doesn't overcomplicate itself which is a practice that I can totally get into when it comes to Metroid, I mean, Catroidvanias. It can be finished in well under four hours during a first playthrough. Seriously, I've said it before and I will say it again. I'm fairly sick of Metroidvanias, but give me an experience in that genre that is under four hours and I am all about it. On that note, when Metroid Prime Remastered Shadow dropped after a Nintendo Direct in February, I couldn't have been more excited to revisit what I feel is probably the best game on the GameCube. And this was a heck of a remaster, although I guess it's more of a full remake with how extensively the graphics were updated. It's incredible just how good this game still is. It's amazing to think that there was a moment in time when fans thought it was absolute blasphemy to make a first-person Metroid game. Look at how well this has aged. And thanks to this remaster, it will continue to age gracefully. Now, I just mentioned Metroidvania Burnout, but it's amazing how Prime 1 doesn't make me feel that at all, even a little bit. I've replayed it at least four or five times since it originally came out, and I have never gotten sick of it. I think a big part of this is how well paced it is. There's at least one upgrade in most rooms, which makes the backtracking much more enjoyable because there's a built-in benefit to it. Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom did something similar, and that ended up being one of my top 10 games of the last decade. Final Vendetta! Was Bitmap Bureau's follow-up to Xeno Crisis, which blew me away back in 2019. This time around, they take on the beat-em-up genre and pull it off with style and grace. From the very first screenshot, I was taken with the large character sprites that felt reminiscent of a Neo Geo game. The characters almost looked like they were pulled from the background of a King of Fighters title. In motion, they animate just as clean as they look, especially the bosses. 
And that music, <laughs> there's some real good stuff here. In an era when the brawler genre is thriving with heavy hitters like Streets of Rage 4 and TMNT Shredder's Revenge, Final Vendetta revels in its simplicity. There's limited special moves and combos, as well as no continues. Yeah, for real. I felt that these aspects were a detriment at first, but once I got into it, I came to appreciate it even more because it asks you to learn the game, but won't overwhelm you in doing so. I took a quick excursion with The Order 1886, the supposed PlayStation 4 AAA killer app from 2015. I would planned on playing it for a while due to how appealing the four to five hour links sounded to me. And all it took was watching Digital Foundry's retrospective on it to get me to commit. I am so serious when I say that this is a really incredible looking game and could pass as something released in 2023. The characters are so big and detailed and have a tangible weight to them. While the steampunk world, despite being really dingy, dark, and gray, absolutely oozes atmosphere with its hazy city streets and airships hovering above. It's just too bad that, despite some really cool weapons, the gameplay is your bog-standard cover shooter from 2009, which, I'll admit, isn't much of a knock against it in the eight years since its release. It's a breezy experience with some fairly annoying stealth segments, but yeah, I can see why there was a bunch of backlash over the way that it ended. I'm sure it wasn't planned that way, and it makes me sad that we couldn't see what sort of gameplay improvements a sequel would have delivered on. But if I had paid full price for this in 2015, I'd have been equally as annoyed. And hey, I like shorter games. Gray, where are you going? To finish what we started. This is no time for vengeance. Come to your senses. That was my Gray, stop! stop! On the topic of four to five hour games, I booted up a short hike one evening on the living room TV and had the best time. When I say this was a four to five hour game, it can actually be much less or much more depending on what you get into. You play as this little uh, bird kid who's on vacation with their family and decides to take a short hike, get it, to the summit of a mountain that you're staying by. Along the way, you'll meet a bunch of colorful personalities who are involved in their own activities, challenges, and problems. And if you help them, then they'll help you. It's really simple, and this was designed to be a relaxing experience, and it shines through because, you know what, you only have to do what you want to do. The endearing characters and journey of self-discovery that the characters go through on this journey just make you feel flat out good when it's all over. I have a feeling that I didn't even come close to discovering all that there is to do on the island before I arrived at the summit, and I'm okay with that. Despite only playing it for one evening, it's stuck with me ever since. And I think this might be a truly special experience for someone in the right frame of mind. October 19th was one of those rare instances where two heavily anticipated games were released on the same day. You had Super Mario Bros. Wonder on the Switch, and over on the PlayStation 5, Spider-Man 2. I don't know what it was, but I found myself very much in the mood for Spidey. And, as expected, it delivered the goods. The last two games really nailed how fun it was to swing around the city, which was improved here in subtle ways, but there was zero reason for them to reinvent the wheel. Simply increasing the world size to include pared-down versions of Brooklyn and Queens was enough for me, and I found it especially fun to explore because I lived in Brooklyn for 12 years of my life. Insomniac's work with balancing the dual characters in Ratchet and Clank ripped apart was practice for figuring out how both Peter Parker and Miles Morales would be able to inhabit the same city at the same time in this game. You can switch between characters virtually at will, but I would get a big smile on my face whenever the character that you weren't controlling would show up to help you out during random street encounters. This goes a long way to them feeling like they exist in this world and are doing other stuff when you aren't looking. Having Miles present for the symbiote storyline truly changed and improved the dynamic in a story that I initially wasn't very excited about. 
Pairing that with the Craven stuff made for an unpredictable story that was good, but didn't quite reach the levels of the first game for me. Regardless, I like this game enough to get the Platinum Trophy in it, which isn't something that happens all that often. It needs to be said, just how well oiled of a machine Insomniac is these days. Their output in the last few years has been insane. I'm excited to see where things go in Spider-Man 3, but also whatever the next game they make ends up being. And touchdown. They'll take good care of you here. Bless you, Spider-Man. I started the Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion remaster late last year, and basically forgot about it till putting together this recap. The original was one of those heavy hitters that was still locked at the PlayStation Portable. So it'd be nice to just check this one off the list. First, was Zack always this annoying? Sephiroth is waiting. Sephiroth? The hero? Wow, I'm gonna meet a hero. I don't recall his original voice at all, but I knew that they had to recast him for this, probably to sync things up with the imminent release of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth in 2024. Secondly, it was playing this that made me consider the question of whether or not there has ever been a successful series, be it books, games, or movies, that wasn't eventually ruined by too much information. I mean, Sephiroth was way more interesting when we knew less about him. Gotta do this. Come on. This will be a good fight. 2023 would not be complete without mentioning Street Fighter VI. I've said a bunch of times over the years that Street Fighter II is one of the most influential games in my life. I just love Street Fighter II so much, especially Champion Edition. But ever since, even though I buy each new entry in the hope that they'll recapture that glory, it's never panned out in the same way. With six, though, I've already put more time into it than I did with four and five combined, which I think says a whole lot about how well done it really is. I think Capcom knew that they were at a crossroads with Street Fighter VI and that they had to reassess their approach, cater to the longtime fans, while also opening everything up to new players with plenty of options to ease them into the gameplay and competition. They've put together something that is so stylistically cohesive that it is really quite impressive. The new characters are diverse and interesting, while the classics are finally allowed to grow up. They all animate with a level of subtle fluidity that would make you feel as though every single frame has had some sort of personal touch put into it. I don't know how good I'll ultimately get, but I'm having fun. Capcom has made something that has made me interested in Street Fighter for the first time since, I don't know, Alpha 2. As we hit the midway point of December, I couldn't hold out any longer from playing Alan Wake 2. But you know what? I waited way too long and Remedy worked way too hard for me to just rush through it so that I could include it in this video. It deserves way more respect than that, you know? So look for my thoughts on that one in next year's video. Man, I got to re-experience the story of Alan Wake 1, watching Drumble play through it on the backloggery streams this October, which had me really itching to play Alan Wake 2, but it sounds like I should probably play Control first. I'm not gonna put Control on my list of 2024 pledge games, but maybe I'll consider it a sort of soft pledge. I'd really like to play through it anyway. And speaking of pledge games, here are a few more of the ones that I managed to finish. I'd been itching to finally play through Bioware's Jade Empire for quite some time, so I finally played the Xbox version on Xbox Series X backwards compatibility. Overall, I had a decent time, but the unfortunate thing is that the combat is just not that great. Maybe things would have been a bit better if I hadn't chosen the magic focused character and continued to emphasize magic stats and transformation styles, but I doubt it would have been a whole lot different. Combat just feels sloppy and spammy. 
it's generally really easy to virtually stun lock enemies that are supposed to be big bad demons. But when I didn't employ such strategies, I would often be wiped out in seconds. I'd have much preferred something less action-y and more command-oriented, because Bioware clearly wasn't ready to pull off real-time martial arts combat in a way that would compete with proper action games. That said, the story is pretty decent, even though I never cared that much about any of the party members. And I really enjoy the world design and its use of color, despite uneven asset quality. I just found it to be a beautiful world to play in, even if it is a two-decades-old game. The last sections of the story felt rushed and unfinished, a la Final Fantasy XV, and I was left with the sense that there were plans to let us explore more of the Jade Empire, whether in this game or in sequels that never happened. I certainly wouldn't mind seeing a much more polished follow-up someday. Focus. Near Automata, or Automata? I don't know, the game says Automata out loud at the very end, but I still feel like Automata is more proper because it's the plural of Automaton, right? At any rate, this was another 2023 pledge game for me, and I'll reassure all you Yoko Taro groupies out there up front that, yes, I did get endings A, B, C, D, and E, so I can indeed say that I beat the main story beyond all doubt. While I never came around to loving the first Nier as much as its cult fanbase, I can't help but appreciate Yoko Taro's distinctive singular vision, his washed out camera style, and of course the haunting and memorable melodies of his game's soundtracks. When gaming's most distinctive auteurs like Hideo Kojima and Yoko Taro revel in trolling the player, I can't help but appreciate that they're having fun doing things that would only be possible in the medium of video games, even when the result can be, frankly, a bit annoying at times. As is often the case for me with the so-called character action genre, I find the gameplay to be a perfectly acceptable vehicle through which I can enjoy the other aesthetic trappings of the game that surrounds it, but the gameplay itself neither particularly bores or excites me. While I certainly enjoyed the experience overall, I'm not going to be applying for the Yoko Taro fan club or anything, but I still look forward to whatever sort of crazy stuff he gets up to next. Who oh, the heck is the Forest King? You're getting distracted. Well, what do you expect? I'm a scanner. Combat was never meant to be my forte. Oh. Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. Hmm, this is a tricky one to discuss because it's hugely beloved, and if I ended up not loving it, then anyone whose favorite version isn't the PS1 version could easily say that I only felt that way because I played the wrong version. I should have played the Sega CD original, you might say. Or maybe I should have used the Unworked Designs patch. I'm sure there are some who swear by the PSP version, or even the GBA version, but the fact of the matter is, the PS1 versions of Lunar 1 and 2 always were more attainable than the Sega CD versions, and I like to play the versions of games that I own. For good or bad, I just want to experience them as they are, even if the version that we got was working designs, and even if that doesn't 100% represent the game as originally designed. Working designs constitutes a part of the game's history that I want to experience, even when it annoys me. I'm hardly a fan, but I do respect the niche that they carved out and the ambition they had for licensing niche games at a time when that sort of effort going into localization was all but unheard of. Did they go too far? Absolutely. But working design's mistakes are now valuable lessons, so localization today is surely better off for what they did when they did it. So in a way, Lunar and the rest of the working design's library became all the more fascinating time capsules for it. At any rate, as much as I love straightforward, simple RPGs like Dragon Quest and Wild Arms, I often found the dungeons and battles in Lunar to be equal parts boring and irritating. 
I appreciate that it's a sub 30 hour RPG, but it took me a lot longer to finish in terms of weeks and months than a game of that length should just because my motivation came and went in spurts. I get that this was a hugely foundational RPG for a lot of people, and who knows, I might have felt the same if I'd played it 20 to 30 years ago. I hear that Eternal Blue Complete is much less different between Sega CD and PS1 versions compared to Silver Star Story Complete, and that the story connections between 1 and 2 are pretty cool. So we'll see. If the party setup and dungeons are balanced and designed more to my liking, maybe it'll hook me better than the first game. Look for my thoughts on it in a year's time. Super Mario Bros. Wonder, which I wish was just called Super Mario Wonder, easier to say, was a big surprise to see unveiled on Nintendo Direct this year. I was immediately in love with the strongly keyframed poses, snappy animations, colorful backgrounds, and overall fresh vibes. As someone who used the instruction manuals and Super Mario Bros. 3 guidebook as drawing reference so much as a kid that it's in tatters, this aesthetic seemed tailor-made just to make me happy. I neither love nor hate the new Super Mario Bros. games, and that's exactly the problem. They're so safe and sterile in comparison to the wildly different aesthetics that define Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3 world and ultimately Yoshi's Island. Super Mario Wonder feels like a long away continuation of that tradition. I think the best part of the Wonder effects is that no matter how unexpected they may be, they're always immediately intuitive with no need for explanations. I believe that this is also the first Super Mario game that I've 100% completed since Super Mario Galaxy, and I appreciate that it was not an overly arduous task to do so. Aside from the unbelievably intense final final challenge, but I'll not spoil that one in case you haven't seen it yet. I always like to pick a game of the year that was actually released during the year, and a new to me game of the year that released some other year. This year, the new to me category was really tough to choose just one game as the winner, so let's go over the three candidates. Of course, I expected all of these to be good, but they were so much better than I expected that the degree to which I fell in love with them was absolutely a surprise. Inside is a 2016 spiritual sequel of source to the 2010 dark puzzle platformer Limbo from Danish studio Playdead. I want to do my best to not spoil what happened, so I'll be as vague as possible and show longer clips with less variety here. Although I will say that it has one of the absolute wildest things I've ever seen in a video game, or a movie for that matter, and I kinda can't believe that they really pulled it off. If you've played it, you know what I'm talking about. But at any rate, I'll just say that Inside got me thinking about video games as an art form more than I had thought about that in a very long time. Not necessarily because the story spoke to me on a deep level or made me feel anything in particular, but because its ability to achieve a clear artistic vision with real-time rendering was in no way compromised by the medium, and the presentation is nearly devoid of any of the technical flaws that you'd expect to see even in AAA games. So with the scope reined in so tightly, the technology behind the game is so good that it becomes almost invisible. And especially considering all that, would you believe that this is a 2016 Unity game, of all things? It's very apparent that the director and technical artists would not accept bad shadows, bad reflections, bad lighting, or bad animations, and every inch of the game is so carefully crafted to support that. Despite how stylized it is, the world feels like it has mass and volume and the implementation of this art style is a perfect match for PS4 class hardware. It honestly feels like it belongs in a museum. The art is so completely realized by Playdead's skillful use of Unity that seven years after release, it feels ageless, and I think that will still be the case decades from now. That's a rare thing for any game to achieve, let alone a game built with polygons. Just goes to show, it's not the tools, it's how you use them.
Ridge Racer 7 may be a PS3 launch game, but it's a top tier video game experience no matter what year you play it in. It feels like an artifact from an alternate timeline of that generation that never happened, where Japanese developers didn't struggle with the start of the HD generation, where they took the lead on pushing to achieve Sony's lavish vision for the PS3, presenting pristine 1080p 60 frames per second gameplay. The result is a totally timeless game on a platform full of games that are widely considered to be not the most gracefully aged. I can't help but wonder what that generation might have been if other developers had taken Namco's lead and not pushed so far beyond the means of the PS3 and Xbox 360, focusing on clean presentation over shiny new rendering techniques that were arguably too ambitious for the hardware. I should also note that while I've always had a bit of a soft spot for Ridge Racer, this is the first one that I've ever played through to the credits, and is indeed one of the very few racing games outside the likes of Mario Kart and F-Zero that has compelled me to go so far. I find the drifting to be much, much easier to pull off than the PS1 and PS2 era Ridge Racers, which is a big part of why it feels so good to play to me, but I'd like to learn to play the earlier games better too. We'll see if it's the start of a racing game awakening for me or something like that. Here comes the final corner. Finish! Mission one, start. As iconic as Metal Slug 3 is, and as much as it tends to be cited as the fan favorite, I'm just as surprised that the insanity that is the game's climax remained unspoiled for me as I am embarrassed that it took me so long to get around to playing it beyond the first level. I won't show anything from the final level so that other newcomers can be as surprised as I was, but I'll just say that the final level keeps going and going and going. And while normally that's probably a bad thing, in this case it's like one of those jokes that gets funnier the longer you laugh at it, resulting in one of the best endgame sequences in side-scrolling action games, right up there with Rocket Knight Adventures. The rest of the game is brilliant too, with lots of interesting choices to make regarding branching paths, so it would still be the best Metal Slug I've played thus far, even without the, dare I say, epic final level. Oh man, picking a new to me favorite from those three is really tough. I wrote the segments for all three having no clue which I was even going to pick. That's how good they are. The thing that stands out to me about all three is that they are so carefully crafted to meet the hardware that they were designed for. They aim high without overreaching and the results are some of the most timeless games of their eras. And Two of them rank among the absolute most bonkers, well-executed climaxes I've ever seen in a game and will absolutely never forget. Man, it's tough, but I think I'm going to give the new to me game of the year to Inside. On another day, I might have picked one of the others, but it really is something special that any enjoyer of puzzle platformers who doesn't mind a dark aesthetic will walk away from with a lasting memory. It's a pretty constant sentiment among people around my age, say mid 40s, to say, I used to be so good at games and now I suck at them. I used to think this about myself and then I realized that I wasn't any better at them, I just had the time and lack of obligations to keep on trying. Now I'm starting to realize that through simply having a better understanding of game design, patterns and memory, that I might be better at games now than I ever was as a child. Axelay on the Super NES is a good example of this. Here's a game that I rented several times as a kid and could not beat it. Now, at 44 years old, I was able to finish two and a half loops of the game before I even had to use a single continue. I think that says something about how good us olds can be at games. Everyone loves to talk about Axelay's vertically scrolling horizon shooter levels, but I think that the side scrolling even numbered levels are where it really shines. You, like me, should give it a try if you haven't played it in a few years. It's a really great 
early to mid difficulty shooter. And I think it's pretty approachable for those that would be intimidated by the genre. I also replayed Illusion of Gaia on the Super NES using the SNES core on the analog pocket while I was laid up with COVID-19. Now, I had this game when I was a kid and loved it. And I bought a complete in-box copy about 10 years ago for a pretty good price. This game is just as good as it was the first time that I played it. Probably even better. Looking at it now through the eyes of an adult, there's just something about Quintet's games that are timeless to me. Even with their sometimes questionable translations, they always manage to say something profound about life and existence and their place in the flow of time. Nearly 30 years after I first played it, I'd say it's aged like fine wine. And now I'm thinking maybe I should revisit Terra Enigma in 2024. Although I first played that more recently than 30 years ago. So if you've never played any of Quintet's games, I'm gonna tell you now, you should get on that. Jewel Master on the Sega Genesis was one of those games that I totally ignored for decades because the name and box art were just so generic looking that I thought that, chances are, it probably sucks. I wonder how many people came to the same conclusion I did in 1991. In playing it this year, I'll admit this would have been a perfect two-day rental over some rainy weekend. I don't think that 13-year-old Corey would have thought it was amazing by any stretch. It's a standard B-, C+, tier side-scroller whose main concept of mixing and matching the various rings that you find to create different power combinations is pretty novel, but it's uh, not exactly revolutionary. Where it really shines is the soundtrack from Motoaki Takanauchi who would go on to compose the soundtracks for Landstalker and most of the games in the Shining Force series. <laughs> Police Knots is one of those legendary games that achieved a sort of mystical status in my imagination. For the longest time, I viewed it as the long-lost Kojima masterpiece, the quasi-sequel to Snatcher that I never had a chance to play thanks to the language barrier. But due to the hard work by the folks over at Junker HQ, at last, I was able to experience police knots in my native language, and wow, it was great. <laughs> I thought that I knew what to expect. What with the way that magazines talked about it back in the day, making me think it was gonna be an even crazier story than Snatcher, except it's not at all. I think the biggest way that this defied my expectations is just how restrained the narrative is for Kojima. To call this a fan translation is doing a severe disservice to the effort here. It's truly exemplary what has been achieved in that it's not only totally cohesive, but it just feels like this is what Kojima himself would have pushed for with a full-on official translation. Outside of the lack of English VO, this feels like the real deal, right down to the endless explanations that make fictional technology seem plausible. In an era when fan translations are just getting better and better, Everyone involved in this should be really proud of the bar that they set over a decade ago. On the topic of fan translations and localizations, Stellar Salt on the Sega Saturn was done by much of the same team that handled Bulk Slash back in 2021, which I loved. This free roaming first person space shooter might not look as impressive as that game, but the team treated it with just as much respect by recording English voiceovers and adding additional controller support. This time, Mission Stick compatibility. 
just an all around uh, <laughs> stellar job by everyone involved. Mission area coordinates confirmed. Initiating jump. I was happy to jump back into the Robit for Jumping Flash 2, and I was treated to more of the same top-tier action platforming that made the first entry one of my favorite games in 2022. When I say more of the same, I mean it, because almost nothing has changed since the first game. Level goals and progression are identical, and the game even seems to run almost exactly the same. The only thing here is that there's a lot more of it. After suffering a heartbreaking defeat against the final boss during our Sunday livestream, I was able to take them down with relative ease a couple of days later. Come on! Oh no! Oh. <laughs> Skyblazer is the follow up from the team at Sony ImageSoft that put out the totally average hook on the Genesis and Super NES. Obviously, this started as a sequel to that, but when a movie never materialized, it was retooled into this. It's a solid game whose price has been inflated a bit the last couple of years, which would make you think that it's a lot better than it is. Sure, it has its moments, like some cool visual effects and the presence of a world map, but sitting down for a playthrough revealed a game that is not only marginally better than its predecessor, but not worth the price that it demands. Can we just take a couple of minutes to talk about how Digital Eclipse has established their very own niche with their interactive documentary games? Atari 50 The Celebration is an absolutely staggering work that not only gives you dozens of games to play, but provides context for each one via interviews, photographs, and an interactive timeline. From Pong to the Atari Jaguar, the sheer amount of content crammed in here is presented in such a way that it never feels intimidating. It pulls you along and constantly surprises you with what games are in here. The amazing thing is, the game library is still growing too. The December 2023 update added in a bunch of games, including one of my favorites on the links, Warbirds. I haven't even addressed the reimagined games that fill out the package, like how Digital Eclipse created the unreleased fourth game in the Sword Quest series on the Atari 2600 using the series creator's original concept designs. But the real star here is Vector Sector, which combines several vector-based games into one seamless experience. Seriously, you gotta play this, and it alone is more than worth the price of the whole darn thing. With the proof of concept established with their interactive documentary design, Digital Eclipse then took that opportunity to zero in on one singular game in that same style. The Making of Karataka served as the first entry in their Gold Master series, a video game criterion collection of sorts, if you will. The coolest thing about focusing in on one game like this is that you get a more nuanced look at the development process, such as how the rotoscoping was done. Bringing Everything Full Circle is an excellent remake of Karataka that pays homage to the original while also being super accessible. With these two games alone, Digital Eclipse has created a totally unique format for exploring video game history. And you can count on me to be totally in for everything that they do in this format. All fans of video game history should be supporting work like this. In April, John Lennon pointed me in the direction of a throwback-style boomer shooter that had just released physically on the PlayStation 5 called Proteus. At first, I thought he was talking about the first-person explorational simulator on the PlayStation 3 and Vita. Proteus was something more visceral, but his big selling point to me was that it was a first-person shooter with a Mario-style world map. I pretty much ordered the game sight unseen, and man, this game is crazy good. The amount of effects and filters slathered across a screen is only eclipsed by the level of gore. If you're feeling intimidated by the boomer shooter genre and didn't know where to start, 
Proteus seems like it could be the perfect nexus point. On that note, back in 2020, Tim Rogers released a video on his YouTube channel, Action Button, that called me out on something that I'd never really considered before. Despite having played the shareware version at a friend's house in 1993, I'd never played beyond the first episode of Doom in any of its incarnations in the last 30 years. Yes, I was a Doom poser. Thankfully, there's plenty of options to make things right. I went with the Switch version based simply on the merit of it being with me when I decided to take action. Having beaten it now, I can say that it lives up to its long-standing reputation, and the Switch version plays really well. But Episode 4, Thy Flesh Consumed, was not even fun in the slightest. The only thing that made it worth it for me was the use of the word gibbitude in the ending. Next up, Hell on Earth. I was excited to get back to the Yakuza series this year, but I also had a bit of trepidation because I was going to be jumping feet first into the remastered games, which lack much of the modern streamlining and conveniences of every single game I played previously. That's okay though, I think I played enough games in my lifetime to understand that the games were a product of when they were created, and not having played the PS2 versions of 1 and 2, this is probably the closest brush I was going to have with the early years of the series. Yakuza 3 opens up a year after 2, with Kiryu running an orphanage on the sun-soaked beach of Okinawa. A nice departure from the grungy streets of Kamurocho. I felt the game's age right away with how it transitions in and out of combat. But for the most part, I didn't have a problem with it adjusting to the limitations that it had to be initially designed with. The real downside here is the overall progression of the narrative. In between your typical high-intensity Yakuza plot, you're forced to deal with a lot of drama, uh, maybe a little bit too much for me, between the kids at the orphanage. So although I wrapped it up in around 22 hours, I did find myself rushing towards the finale a bit earlier and faster than previous entries that I played. Not surprising. Of course, I'm still looking forward to Yakuza 4, but I will admit that it's starting to feel like an unwinnable battle just trying to catch up on the series because two new games, one remake and one side story came out this year alone, and a full-fledged new entry is imminent. <laughs> the level to which I've come to enjoy the Yakuza series in the last couple years, I felt that it was imperative that I finally play through the entirety of Shenmue. As part of my 2023 pledge, I was able to see it through to the end after a whole bunch of false starts since it was originally released on the Dreamcast. In the interest of convenience, I decided to play it via the HD collection. Yeah, I get that the bad English dub is iconic, but this attempt, I was more interested in immersing myself in the world of Japan in 1986. <laughs> Mm. So, what do I think of it in 2023? It was fine, I guess. But 23 years on, the things that really struck me is how technically impressive it is, and how it clearly shaped not only the Yakuza series, but the entire video game industry as a whole. Yeah, it's absolutely goofy and quite janky at times, but I couldn't stop thinking about how they were doing all of this with no real blueprint or template to follow. They were making that template. On that level, the scope of the story in this introductory chapter doesn't need to cast a wide net because they'd spent so many years of development trying to just get it to work. As the credits rolled, I had to hold myself back from immediately jumping into part two if only to see what they could do to flesh everything out now that they've figured out the skeleton. Although, maybe I do need to replay Shenmue 1 on the Dreamcast, the way I probably should have done it in the first place. Oh, this is...
We've already gone over a few games that we both ended up playing, like Metroid Prime Remastered. And Corey let me take the mic on Super Mario Wonder while he talked about Gato Roboto, which was just the perfect length of game for occupying myself on a flight. <laughs> But now we're going to bounce back and forth with our thoughts on a few games that occupied quite a bit of time for both of us this past year. As soon as Final Fantasy 16 was announced, I was all on board. People who hadn't played Final Fantasy 14 were generally a bit skeptical, but FF14 director Naoki Yoshida had more than earned his way to producing the next numbered Final Fantasy along with FF14 team members like composer Masayoshi Soken. And I was also really curious to see how FF14 lore master Koji Fox's localization direction would pan out in that context as well. The end result certainly goes in a different direction compared to FF14 though, and I'm unsure what the game's legacy will ultimately be. Even though your party outside of Clive has little impact from a gameplay standpoint, FF16 has an enjoyable cast of well-written and acted characters, most especially Sid, who is probably the best Sid that the series has ever had, which is really quite something to say 16 entries in. You're dominant. I am. I. Well, not by choice, mind. Old bloody Rome of strapping young lads. And it was this sorry sack of bones Rome who saw fit to home. Sid's ideals and charisma are the foundation that the entire game rests upon, and if they hadn't gotten that right, they'd have nothing. Overall, the story is fairly decent, and I thought the idea of a world where people don't even know how to do basic things like grow crops without magic and had to figure out how to do that was interesting. Although I was disappointed that some things I expected never went anywhere, and I felt a bit unclear on a lot of the exposition regarding the big bad and the mechanics of what he was even trying to achieve. I wonder if the DLC would leave me any more satisfied in that regard. It's hard to deny that the gameplay strays pretty far from Final Fantasy's roots, and while I found the combat to be satisfying and engaging, it's simply way, way too easy on the difficulty levels available for your first playthrough. It hardly strikes the excellent compromise between action and RPG decision making that Final Fantasy VII Remake has, but what are you gonna do? I'd prefer a return to menu-driven combat as much as anyone, but I don't remember people complaining about the lack of RPG-ness in Final Fantasy XV nearly so much, which I think has comparatively much less enjoyable combat. Final Fantasy XVI was a tough one for me. I had almost zero hype going into it, especially since 15 was a low point for me, and I've never even played 14. I made it a point to not watch any trailer since the initial reveal with Joshua having blood splattered all over his face, so I was going in about as dark as possible. It starts off well enough, the sense of scale is really impressive when the icons are on screen doing battle. The battle system is fun enough and the music with its different crystal theme motifs made it feel like a Final Fantasy through and through. Even though I let out an audible groan when it clicked into place just how inspired by Game of Thrones the whole thing is, you cock. <laughs> it bravely presented some challenging subject matter that I didn't expect. That and the voice acting, especially from main characters Clive and Sid, was so good that I was fully on board for the first, I don't know, 20 to 30-ish hours. Final Fantasy has this knack for making every single boss fight feel like it could be the end of any typical game, thanks to the insanity that plays out in front of you, accompanied by the best boss battle music since Final Fantasy IV. But the real problem is, is how it alternates from going 1,000 miles an hour to 5 miles an hour. And then you find yourself just getting into a groove with the battle system where you can employ the same strategy against every enemy and boss, you hit a point in the story where it just all runs out of gas. All the political intrigue and challenging subject matter just dries up and disappears. By the last, I don't know, 35% of the game, it's all running on fumes. I spent the back portion of the story skipping through all NPC and side story dialogue, 
Well, except for the ones with Torgal, because he rules. I hope with the inevitable Final Fantasy 17, Square takes a step back and sees what the series has become. In the face of the positive reaction to HD 2D games and stuff like Sea of Stars, I think most fans of the series would be happy to see the series go back to its original, menu-driven, turn-based roots. I just hope that Square is smart enough and brave enough to act on it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And then, <laughs> there's Vampire Survivors. If you somehow managed to avoid this game and are only seeing it for the first time right now, Every thought that you're having is absolutely true. Yes, it looks like complete garbage with poorly scaled artwork. Yes, it throws a ton of enemies on screen to the point that it runs comically bad. And yeah, it's a real jank fest. There's almost no real gameplay here. Your character just attacks automatically and you just need to avoid enemies. Somehow, <laughs> I managed to get totally sucked into it for nearly 70 hours. It's, it's so stupid. But there's a couple of reasons for this, such as, you know, the music is much better than you think it'd be. But the real reason here is that Vampire Survivors is the perfect turn off your brain type of game, which is nice if you're feeling mentally unprepared to do literally anything else. Apparently, I felt that way a lot in 2023. You know, the way that this game doles out an absurd amount of unlockables just about every time you play it, be it new characters, levels, modes, and modifiers, I just kept on coming back for at least one 30-minute run every day, sometimes more, most of the time more. Listen, I gotta give Vampire Survivors some major respect points. It's hugely addicting, can be had for under eight bucks with all DLC, and it just continues to get free updates. It's bucking the trends that these type of games usually follow. But yeah, it's stupid. It is so stupid. But I'm not gonna pretend like I didn't like it. Man, Vampire Survivors. It's almost as much a parody of itself as it is a parody of Castlevania. revels and wallows and its cheapness to the point that the ugly presentation kind of becomes a feature and part of the appeal. I still need to unlock those credits that Corey got so that I can call it beat, but it's amazing that such a basic concept remains enjoyable after over 30 hours. But like, is that a good thing? Don't get me wrong, I think Vampire Survivors is really fun, or at least it's really fun when you don't have the time or energy to play much else. And I found myself not having the time or energy to play much else a lot this past year. So in that sense, I sort of resent Vampire Survivors for making me feel comfortable with being in that state, rather than being like, hey, I know I don't have a lot of time to play today, but I could still squeeze in some playtime with one of my pledge games or something else, so what's stopping me? So yeah, buy Vampire Survivors with caution. It's definitely fun, and I still feel compelled to play it, but it's also basically dollar store junk food. Not that there's anything wrong with that, other than that it absolutely will take time away from playing more nutritious games that could better nourish your gaming soul. YouTube hates this game. I mean, it yours, I, I didn't think it was unwatchable when, uh, when you streamed. Yeah. Well, what would a 2023 video be without The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom? As the years dragged on following the announcement of a direct Breath of the Wild sequel, I became increasingly bummed out that I was going to have waited so long to play a very similar sort of game on the exact same hardware that I'd played its predecessor on. But you know what? As soon as I started playing Tears of the Kingdom, not only did those thoughts wash away, I actually became glad that this was a game for Switch and not its successor. 
Here's a game that is doing far more interesting things with its open world and freeform gameplay mechanics than almost any competing open world game on much more powerful hardware. Executing it in a shockingly playable and visually pleasing fashion, all things considered. That they had the audacity to give the player a nearly infinite number of ways to break the game's physics, whether from building the most ridiculous possible structures and vehicles, or squeezing up through the game's geometry by making what is essentially a debug tool an actual core mechanic? All that on the humble switch and for it to not fall apart? Seeing this game on such constrained hardware made me appreciate it all the more. But beyond that, the best thing I can say about Tears of the Kingdom is that I was absolutely never bored while playing it. I never wished I wasn't playing it. I never felt ready to go to bed while I was playing it. I never worked late hours while I was playing it, which I really should stop doing anyway, but my gosh, the pull to play this game for hours on end was just so strong. It made me feel mentally and physically just really good. Corey said it best on the Here's My Question For You podcast when he noted that when you start playing, the map is empty and you fill it in with icons rather than the map starts out filled with busy work icons that you need to clear off. What a difference that simple change from the typical open world formula makes. So yeah, it's my game of the year for 2023. Maybe it's a bit of a basic choice, and maybe it borrows a lot from Breath of the Wild, but when a game just makes you feel so good and fulfilled just to be playing it, even after over a hundred hours, what more do you need? Go on then, Link. Draw it once more. I played Zelda for over a hundred hours too, but alas, it was not going to be my personal game of the year this time around. Breath of the Wild was the first Zelda game that I truly fell in love with since Link to the Past. There's a number of reasons for this, but most importantly was how you never knew what you'd find just out of your line of sight at any given moment. Sharing your discoveries with friends harkened back to being a kid on the playground in a way that I hadn't felt in years, but also I haven't felt that way since. Tears of the Kingdom takes this and cranks it way up, and it's ridiculously impressive just how much freedom you're given thanks to the Ultra Hand ability. It's 1000% more impressive that it never breaks despite this. And it's even more impressive that it still managed to run as good as it does on such hardware that is this long in the tooth. The programming wizardry on display here should be inspirational to every game developer. But as good as every single aspect is, it's still the same world as Breath of the Wild. And that took away from how magical the entire adventure was for me. Yeah, the addition of the sky and underground are significant, but neither really offered that same sense of discovery as the regular overworld held. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this felt like DLC to Breath of the Wild, because there's way more than a full game's worth of content in Tears of the Kingdom. But it lacked that newness and unpredictability that Breath of the Wild served up just about every second of the 120 hours that I played of it. I've never been much of a fan of the roguelike genre. I've always preferred the intentional level design versus the procedurally generated worlds that typically influence games of this genre in particular. In spite of this, I decided to give Returnal a go, thanks to the high praise among my peers, and it ended up being my favorite game of 2023. To say that this game blew my face clean off would be an understatement. I've mostly been a fan of Housemark's arcade action style gameplay since I first played Super Stardust HD on the PlayStation 3. With Returnal, they've taken every ability in their arsenal to a totally unseen level. I can't think of the last time that a game so deeply ingrained itself in my psyche, which I suppose is appropriate considering the plot of the game. I was thinking about it constantly when I wasn't playing. And every time I had a couple of free hours, I'd fit in a run to see if I could push my progress a little bit further. There's tons of compliments that I could lay on Returnal, such as how random layouts and item generation being part of the narrative made it much easier for me to accept a mechanic that I typically don't jive with, or how the off-kilter feel of the world inspired the same sort of feeling that I loved a couple of years ago with Control. 
It also has one of my favorite time skips that I've ever experienced in a game. But the fact is, I'm just going to say that it's really, really fun to play. Yes, it's extremely challenging, more so than anything that I've played in a very long time, but the ultra-fast and frantic shoot, dodge, and zipline mechanics handle so deftly that I felt no frustration when I had to restart a loop. I simply resolved to learn and adapt with each life. Despite playing at the very beginning of the year, it's still my favorite game of 2023. I guess what I'm trying to say is, maybe I might be into roguelikes now. Well, at least rogue lights and considering how adamant i was about not liking this genre of game a year ago i'd say that this was a significant turnaround for me Yeah, Vampire Survivors wasn't the only game that Corey was putting so much time into that I just had to see what it was all about myself. And given that most of the people telling me that I needed to play Returnal were also fellow roguelike, roguelite uh, avoiders was certainly convincing. And yeah, it's super awesome. The core movement just feels so good, and the randomized level layouts still have enough thoughtful design and recognizability embedded into the building blocks that I agree, it didn't bother me, and every run felt impactful. I was amazed that each run I was able to look at the map and remember, ah oh yes, I left that behind over there, maybe I should go back and pick it up, rather than the locations just going to mush in my brain from run to run. It felt amazing to get good enough at the game by the end that I was able to do a full run up through the final biome three times without dying as I worked toward getting the true ending. I mean, it was just so good that really it should have qualified for my list of new to me game of the year candidates, but I don't know, choosing a game from only two years prior didn't feel right. Regardless, games like Returnal and dare I say, Vampire Survivors, feel like they could have unlocked something a bit in my brain this year. And I'll admit that I do feel more compelled to try out some of the other best regarded roguelites from recent years like Hades, Dead Cells, and I'm scared about the rhythm aspects and cadence of Hyrule, but if I have to turn that off, I'll turn it off. As long as the level layouts don't feel like junk, maybe I'll enjoy them. We'll see what happens. Encounter hostile predator. Ah! Okay, with those heavy hitters wrapped up, let's take a quick look at a random assortment of games that I played this year that I might not have a lot of thoughts on, but I felt deserved a mention at least. Whether it be something I finished it or not, or if I even liked it at all in the first place. Considering how expensive the Saturn version is, I was quick to import Batsugan Saturn Tribute Boosted so that I could add the amazing Toa Plunge Shooter to my game library in some form or another. This is a decent port, but it lacks many of the frills that we see in other shooter re-releases, such as what M2 is doing with the Shot Triggers line. But you know what? It'll do. Yu Suzuki went back to the well with his new Space Harrier-like Air Twister. Now, I played this on Apple Arcade about a year and a half ago, and the performance was bad enough that I just gave up on it really quick. When a console version was announced, I had to give it another try. I mean, the PlayStation 5 version had to run better, right? Indeed it does, and it's a pretty decent playing rail shooter overall with plenty of uncompelling unlockables. But really though, Air Twister is worth looking into for the soundtrack alone. It might not be to your taste, but I'm sure you can appreciate the vision that it took to go with something like this. Y'all, don't sleep on Demon's Tilt, a spiritual successor to Devil's Crush on the TurboGrafx-16. Now, I'm not a huge fan of video pinball, but sometimes the mood strikes me and I went back to this one quite a bit during the year. I even ended up getting a digital version to have on my Switch for when I just want to play a quick game. 
I will definitely be grabbing the follow-up, Xenotilt, when it hits consoles. Spurred on by HBO's stellar adaptation, The Last of Us Part 1 was my first time fully replaying the original game since the PS3 version was released. Some might call this remake unnecessary, and maybe it is, but it also makes sense to try to capitalize on the timing of the show. While I sort of wish they took the opportunity to incorporate more of the nuanced gameplay of Part 2, that would have been a complete overhaul and would have taken more time than they had to get this out. I wonder if we'll get another remake when the inevitable Part 3 is done. You can't deny the view, though. I revisited Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse HD for the first time since 2013 during our 10-year anniversary livestream. It's certainly not a bad remake. The frame rate could definitely use some work, but the original? That holds up way better. What can I say? I love the story mode in modern Mortal Kombat games, and I always try to make a point to play them when I can score a copy for cheap. So I was able to spend a couple of evenings doing that with Mortal Kombat 11 this year. I was surprised to see that they went with a story reset so soon after 2011 rebooted the storyline. But when Mortal Kombat 1 was revealed, things looked a lot different than I initially expected them to. I can't wait to play that story mode when the inevitable Ultimate Edition is under 20 bucks. I did not do that. I did. Try has already talked a lot about Super Mario Bros. Wonder, but I'm just going to stick it here because I rarely feel compelled to do everything after I roll the credits in a Mario game. And this was no different. Let's be real though, Mario games, they're pretty much always solid nowadays. Although, I was relieved that Wonder is a much better game than any of the new games. In fact, it's easily the best 2D entry in the series since Mario World. It's Gimme Toilet Paper. Yeah, a game called Gimme Toilet Paper. You put a Joy-Con inside of a real roll of toilet paper and give the guy in the game some toilet paper. I gave that low polygon model of a man some toilet paper to wipe his flat shaded rear end. People said that the live stream where we played this was one of the best we've ever put on. People love games about toilet paper. Who knew? Oh, look! What? What's this? <laughs> Plot twist! I, I was not <laughs> expecting that. Big thanks to Dustin Kramer for getting me to download Suika Game, a silly game where you stack fruit to try to make a watermelon. It was a good diversion, but it didn't get its hooks in me like it seemed to with lots of other people. Some of the games that I played this year that I didn't really care for include Blast Core on the Nintendo 64, whose controls frustrated me enough to give up during a live stream. Try didn't think I'd like it much, and while it does have its moments, I had had enough. Double Dragon Gaiden, Rise of the Dragons was decent, but it needed a lot more refinement to hitboxes and invulnerability durations to make it less frustrating. Finally, this should come as no surprise, but Mighty Number no. 9 <laughs> kinda stinks. I was hoping that maybe some distance from the whole debacle surrounding it would allow for softer feelings and some perspective on this much maligned game. But, uh, it didn't. I'm uh, about to spend the last half hour playing something else. Oh, do it, do it. Go for it. There's also several games that I did like that I plan to revisit a bit more seriously in 2024. After putting my feelings on Returnal and roguelikes in general out into the universe, several people recommended Hades and Dead Cells which happened to coincide with a Steam code for the game that included the new Castlevania DLC showing up in the MLEG inbox. I played it for a live stream, and yeah, I think I'm gonna like this a lot. I still have to try Hades too. G.I. Joe on the NES has been a long-standing unfinished in my backlog, and I came pretty close to finishing it during a live stream. I need to head back and do that. I played pretty far into Anno Mutationum over the course of a few days, but got sidetracked and never returned. I love the aesthetic. And gameplay-wise, it made me think of a side-scrolling near Automata. Although I've been interested in it due to how it looks, I finally got a chance to try out Roller Drone, thanks to it showing up on Game Pass. Dang, this game is incredible. The style, the gameplay, 
and the music put it at the top of my must playlist. How the heck does this game not have a physical copy available? As we've mentioned throughout this entire video, last year we both listed 10 games that we pledged to finish in 2023. That didn't work out the way that we expected, but it sure as heck is not gonna stop us from trying it again. So before I get out of here, here's 10 games that I'm gonna to attempt to finish in 2024. Mega Man Legends, Paradise Killer, Landstalker, Red Dead Redemption 2, Yakuza 4, Lufia 2, Psychonauts, Outer Wilds, Silent Hill 2, and Crystallis. Of course, the unfinished games from my 2023 list will carry over. Those include The Last Story, Brave Fencer Musashi, Undertale, and The Witcher 3. I'm gonna try to play those as well, but we'll see how it goes. Well, as you might have gathered, I didn't do as well as Corey did with my pledge games, so I'm gonna have to be a bit more careful with the length of games on my new list. But before that, it's time for a quick lightning round. Now, just because they ended up on the lightning round doesn't mean I didn't like them. Some of these are absolutely fantastic, but I just don't have time to edit longer sections for everything. All right, no more than 30 seconds each, let's go. The first game I beat on Imlig stream in 2023 was Wonderling DX. I got the impression that the audience maybe wasn't super into it, but I don't know, I think it's pretty neat. The gist is that you're the Goomba in a platformer, except you've been powered up with the ability to jump, but nothing else. You can't even move at will, only turning when you hit a wall, just like a Goomba. It's nothing extraordinary, but I still think it's pretty clever and fun to play through. Vengeful Guardian Moonrider is Joy Masher's take on Shinobi or Hagane style gameplay, and it's pretty rad. It can be tough to get a foothold in the game at first, but once you start finding upgrade chips, it becomes easier to make headway. I especially liked how the abilities granted by the chips were compelling enough to encourage me to experiment with different loadouts rather than just sticking with one combination, which is what I'd probably do in most games. I probably never would have given a game with a nondescript title like Battle Circuit a look if not for a request via a backloggery stream directorship, but this is one wacky and awesome Capcom arcade beat-em-up. The way that you use your green special meter isn't immediately obvious, so here's a tip. You have to jump and then hit attack and jump simultaneously in the air. Alien Green special is healing, which needless to say is super helpful. We also finally played through Final Fight 2 on the backloggery stream, or actually that was the Imlig stream, but with drum. It's honestly a bit underrated. Our only particular disappointment was that it was surprisingly easy, but otherwise everything that's built up around it makes for a super solid sequel. It's just that it could never be as iconic as the original. The Japanese version is super cheap, so I think it's well worth adding to your collection and playing through. Lost Kingdoms from From Software always intrigued me because it was released during that period when RPGs were rare as heck on Nintendo consoles. It seems obvious, but paying attention to listed enemy elements on the map and adjusting your deck is crucial to success. I've never been into actual card games, but in video games, I tend to enjoy the balance between control over your deck and being forced to adapt to the situation as your hand is dealt. Corey already talked about a short hike, but I just have to give a quick word on it too. Progression through the game is basically a non-violent twist on 3D platforming formulas, which actually mixes things up in a pretty interesting way. You progress through the world in a very free-form and open-ended manner, and while the challenges that you overcome are different than in most games, it still offers the same sort of satisfaction, which is pretty cool. I wasn't really feeling stray at first, but I started getting more into it once I got into the cities inhabited by CRT-faced robots who themselves decorate their streets and houses with CRTs, which is very much my aesthetic. 
It was an interesting twist against game design conventions and how tight openings like metal bars, which are normally impenetrable in most games, are instead impassable to NPCs, but not the player. Remember Me is the first game from Don't Nod. It's exactly what you'd expect from an Xbox 360 and PS3 game that released after the Xbox One and PS4 were already out. The combo customization system is fairly unique though, and is exactly the sort of element that can draw me more into character action style games if you even call this that. In this case, it didn't quite fully come together for me, but I certainly don't regret playing it. And lastly, I bought an Evercade VS early this year, and I want to mention two games I played on it. Alligator Hunt should already be familiar from when Corey played it a few years ago. This is just a spectacular arcade shooter, and it's amazing that Spanish developer Galico, with the tremendous talent on display in their extremely 90s games, it's just amazing to me that they really flew under the radar until things like Evercade brought their games back. Avenging Spirit was one of the Evercade games that I was most excited to play, and as far as I know, its inclusion on the Jalico Arcade Collection 1 is the only way to own the arcade version physically apart from the arcade board. Whenever I drop the awesome Game Boy conversion in an episode, people are always asking, what game? And the arcade original here is also super great, just a really fun and colorful platformer that lets you control a lot of character types. I'm not going to cover some of the games that I started but didn't find the time to go back to finishing like Corey did, like Super Valis 4. There were a few of those, and I really wish I had finished them. Or there's some of the games I streamed like Tiny Toons Adventures, Babs' Big Break on Game Boy, which was good. Good Konami game, but that and several others that I played just missed the cut for even the lightning round. And we started a new thing on the backloggery streams where we have community directorships, and that led me to replay Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance and Resident Evil Code Veronica. This was actually the first time that I'd played through the original Dreamcast version, which really is lacking quite a bit of Wesker. That's a disappointment. But yeah, there's always got to be a few games that slip through the cracks in these end-of-the-year videos, but it doesn't mean we didn't like them. So anyway, as for my pledge games... Yeah, first year of the tradition didn't go so well for me, but I think it's still a great idea. It's just that I have to be more careful about how many long games I put on the list. And that's doubly true because of the number of long games I'm already carrying over from 2023. To review, from my 10 2023 pledges, I beat only half of them. Mega Man 11, Jade Empire, Inside, Near Automata, and Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. The unfinished pledges that are carrying over to 2024 are Lunar 2 Eternal Blue Complete, Hyper Light Drifter, Viva Pinata, Ease 8 Lacrimosa of Dana, and The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel. And by the way, people did talk me into upgrading to the PS4 version of that one, which turns out to actually be quite affordable if you import the less elusive European version off Amazon UK. And no, you're not going to talk me into playing three or four or 20 different other Legend of Heroes games before I play Cold Steel. I know all y'all Falcom fans have your opinions about where to start and whatever, but I already have the Cold Steel games, and getting through all of those eventually is daunting enough. So. If you want people to play Falcom RPGs, my advice is to not make folks even more intimidated to get going by laying out a bunch of prerequisites. But at any rate, with five carryover pledges, my work is already cut out for me. And with that in mind, here are my 10 new beat pledges for 2024. Willow for NES. Jackie Chan for PC Engine. Dark Savior for Saturn. Space Station Silicon Valley for N64. D2 for Dreamcast. Jack 2 for PS2. Blinks the Time Sweeper for Original Xbox. Heavenly Sword for PS3. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice for PS4. And Doom 2016 for Xbox. There it is. Now, if you recall, I told you that if I didn't finish my 2023 pledges and if there were no Rare After Nintendo episode on Viva Pinata by the end of 2023, 
I wanted you to be very cross with me. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What else can I say? But I think the new list has a lot of pretty short games, Sekiro notwithstanding, so I'm feeling optimistic in spite of my longer carryover games. Think I can make it this time? If not, I want you to be very cross with me. All right, well, that'll do it for yet another The Games We Played. Here's to gaming in 2024. See you next December 31st for the next edition, and of course, all throughout the year for more My Life in Gaming.